Illuminated by IEEE Photonics is a podcast series that shines light on the hot topics in photonics and the subject matter experts advancing technology forward. Hello everyone and welcome to this podcast series of the IEEE Photonics Society. Today our topic is quantum and we will discuss quantum technologies, look into applications and also look into some career advice on how to get into the quantum landscape. My name is Santa Jensen, and I'm your host today. To introduce myself, I've got a PhD in object electronics from the University of Southampton, and I now work in the Netherlands for ASML, a company that makes machines to manufacture microchips. I've volunteered for various different roles within the IEEE, and I'm currently chairing the marketing task force for the, for the IEEE Photonic Society. Today, our podcast is about quantum. And to be more precise, it's about quantum sensing and applications. And for this topic, I'm very excited to introduce you to our moderator, Jacques Carolin. Hi, Jacques. Hi. <laughs> Jacques, you are a senior researcher fellow at the University College in London, and you are currently developing optical technologies for large-scale, high-speed interrogation of neural circuits. So your current research is about applying the principles of physics to understand and ultimately also to repair the brain. Now, before you got involved with this research, you were focusing on quantum technologies and mainly in quantum computing. You started as a postdoctoral fellow at the MIT and then continued at the Niels Bohr Institute. Your PhD is from the University in Bristol and you've been awarded with the Murray Curie Global Fellowship and the BBSRC Discovery Fellowship. And within the IEEE, you currently serve on the Emerging Technologies Task Force for the IEEE Photonic Society. And with this, I want to welcome you to the podcast, Jack. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Senza. Thank you. Can you give us a little bit of an insight of the topic today and who our guest speaker is? Uh, yes, exactly. So our um, <laughs> guest speaker today, we're very fortunate to have um, Amir Helmi, uh, who is a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Toronto. Um, prior to his academic career, Amir held a position at Agilent Technologies in the UK um, between 2000 and 2004. At Agilent, his responsibilities included developing lasers and monolithically integrating optoelectronic circuits. He received his PhD and MSc from the University of Glasgow with a focus on photonic integration technologies in 1999 and 1995, respectively. Um, his research interests include photonic device physics with emphasis on plasmonic nanostructures, nonlinear and quantum photonics, addressing applications in information processing and sensing, and data communications. Uh, Amir is an active uh, volunteer and leader of the IEEE Photonics Society, currently serving as an elected member of the Society's Board of Governors and as a distinguished lecturer. Uh, distinguished lecturer. <laughs> he was also honoured with the Society's 2019 Distinguished Service Award for exceptional contributions to the Photonic Society in the areas of conferences and membership. So uh, welcome, Amir. Thank you. It's such a privilege uh, to be with you. Great, great. Um, so uh, maybe just to kind of get us started, um, you know, you've had a very kind of beautifully varied um, career. You know, you've worked on a variety of different topics, both in industry and academia. Um, and, uh, you know, you've ended up in the fields of quantum photonics and sensing. So I'm curious how you ended up in quantum photonics and sensing. Well, yes, as, as you mentioned, Jack, I have not started in that field. Uh, conventionally, I've started working on active photonic devices, uh, as well as integration technologies. And, and within these, I had special focus on nonlinear optical interactions. So as I grew to develop these technologies and devices uh, within, uh, I, I, I've learned together with my group um, on how one would be able to combine both exquisite active devices such as amplifiers and light sources, lasers, and the such, along with dispersion engineered structures, along with very efficient nonlinear interactions. And some of these could even be combined in a laser source, like a single chip. So it turns out, as I've learned throughout my career, that these are the ingredients that are extremely effective in generating 
very efficient non-classical states of light or quantum states of light. And then from there, as we've learned how to generate these states, we moved forward to learning how to use these states in other applications, particularly related to quantum sensing. Amazing. Great. Um, so when people typically think of quantum technologies, um, often the first thing they think about is, is, is quantum computing. Um, so I'm just kind of curious to get your perspective on um, how photonics um, will play a role in the kind of wider quantum computing landscape. Indeed, I think this statement is absolutely accurate in, of late, in the past perhaps six, seven years or so. Prior to that, quantum computing was not as maybe visible when it compared to all other communication technologies. There were times when quantum communication was significantly more uh, visible. Uh, and over the years, sensing has always been going in the, in the background. Quantum technologies, generally speaking, can tackle all the above or the aforementioned applications, computing, sensing, and metrology, as well as compute. But photonics in particular has certain advantages that can be of great interest to quantum computing applications. The most obvious one is for the photons and the structures they reside in to be able to carry out computing functions and the advantage is there is that the computing functions themselves could be carried out at ultra fast speeds synonymous with the time scales associated with the photons but this is currently the field of great interest in research both in academia and industry and there are a couple of in, uh, industries in north america that focus particularly on using optics to carry out compute. However, that's not the only place where photonics can play a substantial role. All the other flavors of quantum computing that involves ions, atoms, and uh, a superconducting qubits, and also semiconductor qubits, are able to form a compute fabric of a finite size. And depending on one of these, every one of these technologies, that size is dictated by various attributes, be it the technology they are implemented in or other physical um, properties. However, the beauty of photonics and the fact that you could remote an entangled state with great level of uh, fidelity using photons means that photonics can also play a role of interconnecting several fabrics quantum mechanically to actually maintain the coherence of a quantum computer in a distributed fashion. Meaning that if one is able to only make a fabric using a given technology of X number of qubits, I can have four of these fabrics and I can interconnect them quantum mechanically to get them to eventually act as one single quantum computing fabric with the associated benefit of having fourfold the capability. So that's where optics can contribute very broadly in quantum compute. Amazing, amazing. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm just going to ask you know, a, a question. That I, I, think, I think it was really interesting to hear about how you, you know, have worked on these classical technologies and realized that many of the advances there you know, could find applications in the quantum world as well um and i wonder what you know what were the real technical advances um you know when you were working on you know these 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 classical light sources for example where you thought hey this could actually be useful for quantum just kind of try to zoom in on that a little bit um absolutely that's a really apt question i think when we were developing within the group classical technologies with nonlinearities in them, the focus at that time, surprisingly, was to generate highly versatile, highly tunable mid-infrared sources, because the semiconductor materials we were using were transparent all the way to 18 microns or so. That was maybe over a decade and a half ago. However, at that time, the developments of quantum cascade lasers had not materialized or crystallized. 
in time, it was very evident to the group and I that quantum cascade lasers is the real winner by way of power, at least, the photons that come out. Because nonlinearities, no matter how widely tunable, they're not able to provide you with the same level of um, powers. However, the very same technologies, if you use them in the complement fashion, where you actually end up um, pumping the crystal or the, the semiconductor material with the high energy photons, you can generate non-classical states of light that one is able to engineer their their state by carrying out engineering to the dispersion of the structures within which they were generated. So the real breakthrough was that we invented a way and we demonstrated a way, a fashion, by which we can instill or phase match second order nonlinearities in conventional laser structures that you can fabricate, you can design in one continent, fabricate in another continent, and package in a third. Extremely uh, accessible, if you will. And when we carried out that work, lots of other groups in Europe and in Asia and elsewhere have followed suit and, and started to use that technology to generate these. And that was the really key development that allowed us to utilize these in extremely practical sensing platforms. And, and just to, to carry on with that a bit, now, was this a theoretical uh, advance breakthrough that you know people just didn't know how to um you know didn't understand the quantum optics well enough or was this you know uh, a, a, a hardware breakthrough had you you know could you do fabrication that no one else could i just want to get a feel for that oh absolutely that's a fair question jack it was really a design breakthrough how can one realize a relatively effective semiconductor laser, but at the same time, within it, also instill exact phase matching through basically uh, maintaining conservation laws for the photons inside that cavity to utilize very efficiently second-order nonlinearities. Once you have these ingredients in one cavity, a lot could be achieved. And part of the value of this design slash invention is that it is extremely accessible to realize, manufacture, and fabricate. So it wasn't a very difficult aspect to, to fabricate. On the contrary, most of the development was in the design rather than the uh, structure and how difficult it is. Amazing. And I think that's just a great kind of, um, you know, parable for how quantum technologies advance anyway, right? You know, folks are pushing hardware, folks are pushing design and theory and these things come together beautifully. I think it's, it's super cool. Indeed. So, oh, can I ask a question? Um, yeah. Follow up on this one as well. Absolutely. <laughs> Please. You, you said you, uh, other research groups were following uh, the research you were doing and um, did you work together with them in any way afterwards? Or how did that No, uh, there was... No, it wasn't really afterwards. It was in parallel while well, groups read our paper and picked up the topic in Europe, particularly, and in Asia, and pursued it themselves. There was one particular group that is Innsbruck uh, that we collaborated very early on uh, to characterize the states that we have designed and generated when the group leader was in Waterloo. But then, since then, um, that the group leader moved on to um, Innsbruck, and then he pursued the work with Würzburg uh, uh, collectively. All right, brilliant. Thanks for that. Pleasure. Sounds amazing. Um, so just to kind of zoom in on some of the topics that we've been going around, you know, one of the big um, uh, efforts of you and your group at the moment is to do in uh, quantum sensing. So I wondered if you could give us a brief overview of how quantum technologies can help with sensing. Absolutely. So by virtue of us having learned how to engineer the quantum state in a very practical fashion, we started thinking a little deeper as to how can one profit from almost a butterfly mount device from which you can get 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 9 photons per second, which is a relatively large photon flux of entangled photons. What? How can it benefit um, applications? My group does not work in communications or compute, but it was very apparent to us through some design and calculations that the lowest hanging fruit where we can make measurable advance is sensing. 
Because in sensing itself, one could actually engineer the state to design very lost and noise resilient states. And that's very unconventional to, to quantum because usually we're very sensitive to loss and noise. And one can design certain states that can achieve that for, for example, target detection or LIDAR. And within the same platform, one can use that for also some uh, imaging in both uh, biosensing and bioimaging as well as lithography. So one could use some of these states that are extremely fra fragile, yet loss and noise resilient, to benefit several fields. So far, we've only pursued the LIDAR, uh, but we are very soon going to also pursue the biology side. But the, this, it's the same set of skills and same set of tools that can enable these quantum states to influence a resist. And the challenge here is how to have enough photons to influence that resist or to influence a biological tissue. And the question here is also how does one uh, get um, sufficient contrast in these biological issue to uh, uh, to to be able to influence uh the sensing and make it much more advantageous than conventional sensing other states that also can help a great deal in a very generic fashion are the famous squeezed states where one is able to squeeze the light the noise out of one quadrature and relay it into another quadrature and stay with the low noise quadrature to use that for several applications and the obvious one if we're going to have less noise is one is able to build interferometers where their sensitivity is no longer dictated by the standard quantum limit but uh, one can beat that uh, significantly so these are the applications where sensing can actually benefit um, uh, se sensing using quantum states can benefit the field I must emphasize that many of these applications at this point in time are actually limited to providing advantages in sensing to modalities of sensing where you are limited in the amount of power. So if you have a sensor where you have a, tons of power and your signal to noise ratio is well above tens of dBs, then these protocols don't really provide you with a, a clear advantage. It's important to highlight that so then everybody is familiar as to where quantum can benefit sensing. It's not a blanket everywhere. It's usually in a constrained system where we are constrained by power because of, for example, bleaching in biology or stimulating, uh, if you like, nerves or uh, synapse uh, or similar. For example, if we have issues related to a LIDAR where you have thousands of it in the same spot. Amazing. That's really, that's, that's, that's super, super interesting. I think um, the, it would be great to hear a bit, you know, I've, I've seen you publish some really cool papers on this recently. It'd be great to hear a bit more about quantum LIDAR. Um, you know, what's the idea there? And um, yeah, what's going on? <laughs> so the idea of a quantum LIDAR is rather simple. It, 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 at least in the modalities we have been pursuing, we have been inspired by a protocol de developed primarily in MIT by colleagues there that is called quantum illumination. Quantum illumination is exactly what it says on the box. You basically illuminate your targets instead of classical light, a laser, for example, or coherent light, or even incoherent light with a, in, with a quantum state, a non-classical state. And depending on the modality that you use, that can provide you with advantages when you end up retrieving that quantum signal as opposed to uh, the, the performance of the system when you end up retrieving a classical signal. Here, again, as I emphasize, that the advantage is usually perceived or obtained when the system is constrained in the amount of power it's able to use. So if this is not in the single photon regime where you're really constrained in power, then the advantage ends up dwindling as the power goes up. However, recently, work that is under review right now, we managed to actually get that advantage to work even at much higher powers, and we would able be able to achieve an advantage between classical and, and, and slightly engineered or quantum-inspired states by approximately 100 dBs or so. That was published, actually, in the IEEE Photonics Conference post that light. So these are the ideas of how can one use quantum to benefit power-constrained LiDAR systems. Hmm. Um, 
Oh, yeah, it's great to get a sneak peek of that as well. Um, that sounds really interesting. I wonder, um, um, I think what's super interesting is that your group is, you know, working on technologies, like you say, um, that can be mass manufacturable, that people around the world can build, um, rather than, for example, requiring a really complicated optical setup that, you know, might you know, require multiple students to keep aligned all the time. So I guess I'm wondering is like, do you see it as being important for practical quantum sensing applications that the technology is, is robust? I think it's critical, Jack, in the sense that so far quantum has always been for the dominant uh, uh, number of occasions has been pursued in physics department. And incredible advances have been made. But with a few exceptions, such as University of Tokyo, Queensland University, and some other locations in the United States, such as MIT, the work has not been conducted in engineering departments. So it, it is a valid, it, it's a valid cause for one to be able to think about a quantum enhancement in a system that does not provide a sort of a, a, a a superior performance to any classical system, which is called quantum supremacy, but instead to to basically get a significantly more practical system to provide an advance over the most, uh, if you like, utilized or or existing practical quantum uh, classical systems. So having that advanced over something where you do not sacrifice the manufacturability, yet you still get a ten thousand fold advance. On re or like what we've shown recently, 10 to the 10-fold advance, it's still, from an engineering science perspective, it's still a worthy cause. I understand, however, that because the, the quantum supremacy is one of the most uh, attractive notions that is being pursued, particularly in compute right now, most of the groups would be trying to pursue that. I still think there is significant um, profit that we can have as I mentioned, in lithography, biosensing, target detection, and standard, quite, uh, standard substandard quantum limit uh, interferometry that can be had in slightly significantly less complicated systems than conventional quantum that can provide an advance, albeit not being a, a like a quantum supremacy type of advance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that, that kind of absolutely makes sense. That's yeah, that's really great. Um, uh, I think maybe, you know, a, a good, I guess we've got time for everything. Um, what I'd like to ask is, related to this question that we just discussed, you know, the landscape of quantum technologies has really changed over the past 10 years. You know, it's moved out of physics departments into engineering departments. Um, it's now even moved out of academia and into industry. Um, for example, in Toronto, you know, you have one of the big players there, Xanadu. So I just wanted to get your kind of perspective on this more kind of industrial um, setting for quantum technologies. Uh, how is this affecting your work? Are you seeing, you know, you collaborating with folks there? Just to really kind of, yeah, get your perspective on it. I think it's extremely exciting from where, from my vantage point, uh, the idea that there are lots of industries that are now uh, set up to pursue quantum technologies in any field, including Xanadu, of course, our our, our local uh, company. It's very exciting, and it is well. It's it, it it this is the right time for it. It's really not overdue, but it, this is the right time in the sense that that reinforces the point that I was trying to make prior, saying that right now there is every opportunity to move many of the quantum advantages from the physics realm to the engineering realm, where there are still plenty of challenges to be solved. However, they're slightly different in nature than the ones in physics, uh, and they could still enable uh, the utilization in practical settings of all these great uh, effects that we have. Um, what that affects... Sorry to interrupt. What that yeah, yeah, affects, no, no, though... What that affects is the type of work that some individuals in the physics department do, but more importantly, the number of individuals, the talent that is flocking now to uh, quantum. 
So if you observe on various campuses, including the University of Toronto, the number of students who cannot wait to start working on topics such as quantum computing by virtue of, of, of the excitement that's going on in the industry and academia and government labs, you would be amazed. I wish I was working in, in quantum computing so I, I, I could get many of these students, but, but nonetheless, it's still exciting. So that's really what the one of the biggest differences that are ongoing right now in this field. It's the appetite, so to speak, of the talent to come in. This is in part due to the excitement about the promise of what such technology can deliver, but also the number of jobs that are available for these individuals. Um, amazing. That's yeah. That, that that's really insightful. Thank you, Um So, do you just we can edit this out? Do you think it's worth us moving on to um, uh, career and professional development stuff now, just to make sure we've got enough time for everything? Um, yeah, I, I, I haven't. I haven't spoken about like your nanosonic structures, um, Ahmed. But I don't know. If, maybe we can come back there if there's time later. If yeah, if there's time, we can get back to it. That maybe we want to do the important stuff first, and then we can get back to it if there is time and interest, if you will. Sure, that sounds that sounds great. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Chuck. Uh, to uh, yeah, to the career questions then. Okay. Um, as you mentioned, Amir, there's a lot of uh, students who probably did not study necessarily in the field of quantum per se. Um, do you have any piece of advice for them on how to move forward? Should they want to uh, go into the uh, quantum research or even quantum industry? Absolutely. I, 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 what I would say is that this is an extremely exciting field and rewarding by way of uh, career opportunities. So, but, but it doesn't have to involve one having a degree in quantum, a degree in any related field, math, math, sci, engineering, physics, or chemistry, could be enough with sufficient supplement in quantum to make these individuals extremely eligible for getting jobs in industry. You would be surprised how interdisciplinary many of these companies and many of these career opportunities are, and the f one should not be apologetic of having a degree in a, in a field that is not squarely quantum, one should celebrate and, and, and utilize that along with some quantum supplement, if you like, and that would make an individual very valuable for various companies. That's very encouraging to hear that uh, you can still switch your topic and be successful if you want to go into research or into industry. Thank you for that. Of course. Um, I was also wondering... It sometimes can be helpful if you have a mentor who uh, who works in a certain field and you can address them. I'm wondering how what what would your perspective um, of mentorship is? Is that something that has been important to you in your career? It has been pivotal, and 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 the more we can provide mentorship opportunities, uh, the more we are investing in our field and in the talent that is upcoming in the field. Early on when I started my academic career and even prior to that was when I was in industry, I used to be involved in IEEE and that helped me have access physically and otherwise to, to mentors that I can speak to face to face in conferences, uh, to, to ask them questions that, are, that one might not be able to read about. There are lots of cultural issues within a given society and these cultural issues about what should be done, how should it be done, when it should be done, the, the, the decorum, if you will, or the protocols that are unspoken. And sometimes these are quite important to, to, to get one through one's career. So the idea of one being able to have access to some willing individuals to, to talk with one uh, uh, and, and provide that in, insight is extremely valuable. And I was fortunate to, to would have been able to have that throughout my career um, within IEEE particularly. Right, great to hear, thank you. You mentioned the involvement or your involvement with the uh, with the IEEE early on. Um, can I ask when did you start volunteering and how has that then impacted your career? I started volunteering very early on, maybe in the, my final year in undergraduate and that has been inspiring to say the least. There wasn't really much of an opportunity to meet individuals given that I was doing courses, but for one at that stage to be able to see 
or project the topics that one is studying in one's undergraduate to where can that lead to in the future is extremely inspiring. At that time, I had not made up my mind when I would go into research or, or industry. And I even have started to work in industry in Africa prior to my to, to, to my graduate studies, but then very soon I realized that uh, maybe graduate studies would provide me with sufficient depth and ability to learn, like the opportunity to learn how to learn for the future, and that's why I switched. After that, throughout my graduate studies, and even after that, when I was working in industry, I've always been volunteering, and that provided not only the, the knowledge base to, to see upcoming developments and what's exciting and, and what's not, but also access to mentorship and inspiration. That's great to hear. So it did not only help you with finding a mentor, but also helped you guiding in your career in a certain direction that you wanted to go into. I think so. That's what I found. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, um, I was I was wondering from from your perspective, is there is there one leadership lesson that you have learned in your career which you would like to uh, give to our um, early career researchers i think from a from a, a lesson if you will that the only constant in our field is change and one should not run to um bandwagons and exciting topics just before because lots of people end up jumping on these bandwagons because they are the least resistance path to, to being recognized. And one should perhaps persevere a little bit if one has sufficient um, belief in what, in, in what one is doing to, until he or she sees this topic into fruition. It's very easy given the large funding programs in, in Asia and Europe and, and North America for one to choose the topics that are most um, funded and to run after them as many of us do uh, but but that would not generate black swans and and great uh, advances and breakthroughs if everybody did that and then we would all end up running from one bandwagon to another that's a really good uh, good tip what's the uh, what's the right balance though between perseverance and change I think the, the the balance is probably in is the balance is probably provided center from the rest of one's life in the sense that we are individuals that have many vistas of life other than work, um, family, uh, uh, other interests, etc. And it depends how much one can focus on a given topic with minimal rewards or lack thereof. Uh, while still being able to maintain a job, maintain a postdoc, maintain uh, uh, one's um, well-being. So that that would, in my mind, be um, the place where one needs to think about not just exit routes, but also one is always encouraged to think about transferable skills. So whatever one chooses to do, as long as one is doing it with great uh, passion and rigor, perhaps one should always think about that with a view of from what I've learned in this particular set of skills and to Jack's question when I was learning how to generate lasers and nonlinearities etc had I been a, a little dogged about that I needed to, to generate mid mid um, infrared uh, radiation I would have continued to be doing that right now with not a lot of success but at that stage, I saw that maybe there is no room for, for the competition given the other options, and then I moved. So transferable skills, uh, I think, would be an extremely wise way for one to always have options, even if the research, which by definition is risky, does not pan out. Pan out. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you for that. And one final question. Um, because you've got experience in industry and also in academia, Specifically for quantum, I think there's also a lot of startups, as we discussed earlier as well, um, that do uh, work in this in this field. Do you see a benefit of uh, working in in all of those three sectors, say academia, um, the startup, and industry? Absolutely, I think they come with relatively different viewpoint. Although the science would be the same, but 
what we are able to achieve, what we would like to achieve, the aims and the means and the timescales by which we achieve these things, the priorities are all rather different. So one obtaining a perspective in at least two of these three, sometimes it's not feasible for one to be able to get all these, uh, if you like, within to fit them within one's early career, then it would make us much, well, balanced, at least from a viewpoint rather than uh, many other things. Okay, and that would also then help with the uh, transferable skills that you mentioned earlier when you then ch start changing in, uh, in different topics as well, having Precisely. experience in the industry. Okay, Precisely, brilliant. thank you. <laughs> thank you, Amr. I think from a career development questions, we're through with our questions now. Um, we still have a final summary and the takeaways. Um, I think some of the takeaways, and I think uh, Shak and Amr, I think I need some help there as well. Some of the takeaways that I um, took away from this uh, this podcast is that uh, photonics play an important role in quantum. Um, for quantum computing, for example, photonics has the potential to do uh, computing functions in an ultra-fast speed. For other applications, um, Amr, you mentioned that photonics can quantum mechanically interconnect different technologies to form one. So that's one of the other benefits of uh, of using it, photonics. Yeah, F technology. compute. Yeah, exactly. Compute fabrics. It can expand computing. It, it can make some of the computing uh, modalities more more scalable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, and in particular with quantum technologies in regards to sensing, we heard that uh, quantum can create uh, loss and noise resilient states which are then particularly important for LiDAR and uh, imaging. And um, that quantum is not a, <laughs> um, what is it, a, a solution it's, for all. It's uh, very beneficial in, in constraint systems that you mentioned. So some examples are when you have power limitations or when stimulating nerves, for example. But um, they're not the solution for everything. Indeed. Do you have uh, do you have some summaries as well? Yeah, I think one of my um, takeaways is that um, I think it's great to hear about how the technologies you're developing um, in a whole you know might be applicable in areas that you hadn't thought about. I think it was really great to hear how Amir had you know been working on mid IR technologies, um, and it turns out that many of these things are. Um, super important for generating funky quantum states of light. I think that's really great. And now you know, there's a whole host of application areas of that. So I guess my personal takeaway is just that really keeping open to the possibilities. Um, I think that's a, a really important lesson for, for everyone. That's yeah. a really good one. Spun on. <laughs> yeah. Meaning. Yeah, and from a... From a career perspective, if I, if I may round up these ones as well, um, from a career perspective, um, I think it's important to have the right balance between perseverance and change. I really liked your comment there, Amir. And uh, not run into the newest trend, but also um, yeah, keep the focus on uh, technology, other technologies and how they can, uh, can help us in the future. Thank you. Thank you. One thing, if you would like me to add with respect to the career center, as at this point in time, careers in quantum are particularly important. The idea of, for one, not to be apologetic about having a background in physics, chemistry, material science, or, or engineering is particularly apt when you look at photonics now being a department in many companies that did not have photonics conventionally, such as, for example, um, Apple or the likes. And even quantum is now a department in companies that did not have a not only optics in the past, but even quantum in the past. So right now, there are lots of openings in places like Amazon, for example, that is looking for individuals that understand uh, some aspects of quantum technology. So that, as you can imagine, would require these individuals to have some sort of an engineering background as well, because Amazon is not just a quantum company. So so the idea of having some quantum background within an underlying degree is probably a much better option than just having a quantum background, given 
the uh, given the plethora of of, uh, of opportunities available in companies conventional companies that have not customarily had just a, a quantum stream so that makes the whole team as a as a whole more diverse as well coming uh, from people with different backgrounds and different ideas rather exactly. than everybody focusing in, in quantum that's pretty exactly. really interesting thank you Amir um, and I think that uh, leads us My to pleasure. the end of this uh, this podcast. Thank you very much, Zach, for moderating and Amir for being our guest speaker today. It was really a pleasure to uh, to host this session and I'm looking forward to more episodes. <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure and honor to the inaugural speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, both of you guys. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.